Welcome everyone, both in person and on Zoom to Nyakiri Chapel. I am Gabriel Nelson, an MDiv student at Bethany Theological Seminary and Zooming in from Midland, Michigan. This week, we will hear a sermon by Dr. Tamisha Tyler, theopoet and assistant visiting professor of theology and culture and theopoetics. I invite those on Zoom who are able to do so to please turn on your cameras and those in Nyakiri to stand as you are able for the call to worship, invocation, and hymn to follow. Our call to worship this week comes from Romans 11. Oh, how dip, deep are the riches and wisdom and the knowledge, how inscrutable the judgments, how unsearchable the ways of God. For who has known the mind of God or been God's counselor? Who has given God anything to deserve something in return? For all things are from God and through God and for God. To God be glory forever. Amen. Please join in our invocation, led by two voices. Lord God, giver of all good things. Grace us with your presence now. Illuminate our minds to understand you more deeply. And our hearts to love you more truly. Enable us to use our gifts to glorify your name in our midst today. In Jesus, our mighty, mighty Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. We join together now and sing our praises to God in the hymn. Please sing along with the words displayed on the screen. Come, thou long-expected Jesus. Please be seated. Our sermon today is based on Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, 
the parable of the talents. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made you two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servants, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gathered where I have not scattered any seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him, who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, not even what he has what will be taken away, or even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Will you pray with me? To the God who asks for more than we have, but gives more than we need to respond, we thank you. We are not always aware of the gifts that you give us, and in our ignorance, we hide them. Help us to see what you have placed in our hands. Help us to learn that they work best when they are offered to others. Move us out of the caves of our fear and into a place of abundant generosity, so that we may be the instruments of justice and peace. Amen. So, I cannot start this sermon without starting a confession. I, Tamisha Tyler, am the third servant. Allow me to explain. In 2011, I left a church that I'd been ministering at for six years. It was probably the worst church split that I had ever encountered. And I was so broken that even visiting a church would result in panic attacks. So I vowed to not only never step foot in a church again, but to never minister again, and surely to never preach again. This proved to be a rather difficult set of promises I made to myself, considering the fact that I had just begun my MDiv. But I somehow determined to protect myself from any further damage that the church could cause me. After about nearly a year, a few friends convinced me to go to their church with them. Fine, I said, but I will do nothing. I may have broken the first promises of not going to church again, but I would not minister or lead or take on any responsibility. A few months later, I got the rude awakening that in order for me to graduate, I'd have to complete a church internship. Fine, I said, but I will not preach. I had now broken two promises to myself, but I was determined not to break the third. So when my then pastor asked me to preach as a part of my internship that next year, I proudly declared no. It felt good to keep that third promise. Fast forward a few years, 2015, and now I am officially a graduate. I'm trying to figure out my place in the world. And after extensive prayer and discernment at the end of that year, I decided to read this book, by Shonda Rhimes called The Year of Yes. How to dance it out, be in the sun, and be your own person. And I thought to myself, I want to do those things. And so I decided to embark on a year of yes. 
basically a year where I say yes to the things that scare me. I remember confiding about this year of yes to a friend and saying, you know, I really hope no one asks me to preach. I'd done so well at keeping that third promise to myself. I even managed to pass homiletics as an MDiv student who did not want to preach. So you can only imagine my reaction when I received a text message from my good friend and classmate, Samantha, with no prompting that stated, do you think you can preach at my church on Palm Sunday? When do you have to know by? I asked, as I wanted to know how long I had to weasel my way out of it. But my friend who I told about my year, yes, had already seen the text invitation and reminded me, you know you have to do it, right? Fine, I said, but only because of this stupid year of yes. This doesn't mean I have to like it or ever do it again. So I did it and, you know, it wasn't terrible. I met with the pastor of that church shortly after my sermon and he'd asked if I'd ever consider preaching again. Sure, I lied, knowing full well that once this year yes was over, that was it. I was sure I can put off invitations until then. So I put it out of my mind. Besides, at this point I had grown and I was actually doing things in the church. I was even in a church planting internship. I mean, how churchy is that? You know, that's gotta count for something. So I chalked up this broken promise of preaching as a fluke, gave myself some grace, and reclaimed my resolve to never step foot in a pulpit again. Fast forward to December 2016, and I was invited once again by that pastor to participate in preaching. Pray about it, he said. It's weird, I walked away from that meeting and for the first time in years, I actually considered breaking the final promise to myself. I finished my year of yes earlier that month and was now facing the desire to do what I had gone out of my way to protect myself from doing. I felt that there was no way that this was anything but God, and I quickly sent a text confirmation to confirm before I came to my senses. A confirmation was received and the date was set. Then regret slowly began to take over. The anxiety attacks returned and I was left wondering why I'd broken my final promise. This brings us back to my confession, that I am the third servant. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, the first time I tried to preach on this passage, I came up with all these different cool ways that this passage was read that was either wrong or could be seen you know, in a different light. You have heard it said that this passage is about happiness or, you have heard it said that this passage is about abundance and doubling your money. Or you have heard it said that this passage is about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And for each point, I had some nicely articulated counterpoint about God's abundant economy of hospitality or, you know, some cool, sexy trend word preachers use nowadays. But none of those points came together. I was left not only with a bad sermon, but with the reality of the fear I'd swore I'd never subject myself to again, that preaching was something I could not do. Frustrated at the time, I slammed my laptop shut. And in seeing my frustration, a friend I was studying with asked, can I pray for you? She prayed and I cried like a baby. I knew that what I'd had wasn't gonna be enough. So I stepped away from my study and I asked God, what do you want from me? What do you want me to say to these people? And I felt the spirit say, you have heard it said that this passage is about some radical sense of abundance or economy. But I say to you that it is about being faithful to me even when it will cost you everything. You daughter are the third servant. You made a promise, actually three, that you couldn't keep. You decided that your feelings and your perceived safety was more important than being faithful with what I had given you. Uh, okay, ouch. Also, how is that a sermon, God? Like, what am, I, what am I supposed to do with that? You think that I'm just supposed to get up here and expose myself in front of all of these people? And so here we are. Again, because this is not the first time I've had to tell this story in front of a congregation. And yet here I am in another pulpit preaching again. And here I still am coming to this passage in a way I never expected. 
Here we find the words of Jesus situated in a series of parables that show what the kingdom is like. Jesus tells these stories to show the contrast of the kingdom in the face of bleak realities at the end of the age. In chapter 24, he describes a world that sounds a little too close to recent headlines in my news feeds and reminds us to stay vigilant during hard times. I'm sure many of you have heard or seen some of the reiteration of the last parable in Matthew 25, which calls out those who do not feed the poor or clothe the naked or welcome the refugee. It seems as if we have, come, have become professionals in calling out what others fail to do. And this calling out at times is necessary, but I would like for us to sit with this parable of the talents and to wrestle with what it means when we allow our fear to paralyze us. This is what happened to the third servant. So we have these three servants and they're each given a share of their master's wealth according to their ability. Then the master leaves. Notice that the passage does not indicate any instruction given, only that he trusted them with what he left them with. Upon his return, he comes to settle accounts. The first two servants go and show that they have doubled what they received and their efforts are rewarded. But the third servant comes and hands back his trust in the same way he received it, probably dirty from being buried. He says to him, hey, look, I, you know, I know you're all powerful and everything and like reaping where you don't sow. And I mean, I only had one talent. Like, what difference does that make? So I was scared and I thought the best thing I could do was just protect what you gave me so I wouldn't get lost in damage. So, you know, here you go. I wonder how long the awkward silence was before the pastor or before the master went off. And it's at this point, you know, my imagination gets all crazy. And I think about those epic lectures that TV moms give, right? Like in my head, I'm thinking about Claire Huxtable and I'm thinking about Theo coming in and gives a talent. He goes, you know, here you go. And then she gives one of those looks right before she gives the lecture. And she goes, what do you mean here you go? I trusted you with this and you put it in the ground. The least you could have done was give it to the bankers. At least they would have got a little something back from it. How dare you come up in here after I've, get, I've been gone all this time and you come in my face when I get back telling me, I'm sorry, I was scared, here you go. Give me that talent and you get up out of my face talking about here you go, there you go, right? And of course there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so I'm sitting here thinking, you know, on behalf of the third servants, I can see how he wanted to make sure you got back what you gave him. And immediately we hear the response. If I wanted it back the way it came, I wouldn't have trusted you with it in the first place. Okay, good point, understood, understood. But again, on behalf of third servants, he remained faithful huh, by keeping safe what you gave him. Faithfulness never results in things staying the same. True faithfulness always leads to abundance. True faithfulness in the face of great oppression and fear yields even more abundance still. We are never told how the first two servants doubled their talents, only that they did and that their faithfulness was rewarded. Were they afraid to? Did they weigh the options and calculate the odds too? Surely they must have known that there was some risk involved, but they didn't allow any of that to stop them. So what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us third servants who find that the stakes are a little too high or that there is a little too much danger or we've weighed the options and calculated that it is better to protect our gifts and ourselves from what we anticipate will be loss or damage? You know, I see a lot on my news feeds about the domino effects of recent election results or yet another police or school shooting. And I often see that there are two types of people who respond. The first type are those who just show up. I find out about what's happening because they're posting live in their news feeds or they're posting names and numbers of city officials to call or they're organizing meal plans for people who have lost loved ones or whatever it is, they are there, faithfully offering their gifts in whatever way they can. We saw an example of this a few years ago during the perceived immigration ban when immigration lawyers went to the airports and offered free services in the immediate need. The second group of people, though, are called the 
WCID or what can I do, which ideally is personified by the shrug emoji. They stand behind their Facebook feeds or in their homes and they ask, what can I do? Now, this isn't a bad question as sometimes we genuinely do not know what to do. But sometimes that question coupled with perpetual inaction reveals a deeper truth. That we are not asking because we want to do something. We are asking so we can have enough information to calculate whether or not it is going to be worth it for us. This, this is the flaw of the third servant. Friends, faithfulness is not a calculation. It's an action. It is often spontaneous and at times it can be costly. God has entrusted us with something and sometimes it comes without instruction because we already know what to do. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the refugee, reach the good news. Offer your gifts, especially when it will cost you. You have heard it said that this passage is about some radical sense of abundance or economy, but I say to you that this is about being faithful to God even when it costs you because true faithfulness always leads to abundance. You know, I chose to revisit this passage because my students are currently reading and discussing Parable of the Talents, but a novel by Octavia Butler. This work is the sequel to the Parable of the Sober, which is a dystopian novel about a 15-year-old Black girl named Lauren who rejects her father's Baptist tradition and creates a new religion called Earthseed. The major idea of Earthseed is this. All that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. In Parable of the Talents, Butler creates a rather complicated religious landscape, and we are witnesses to the decisions Lauren must make for her own survival and for that of her community. While it is debatable whether or not Lauren makes the right decisions, what I believe Butler, or one thing that Butler could be sharing with us is that Lauren does not bury her talent. She offers her gifts consistently to her community in efforts to create better worlds. She recognizes that action is central and necessary to her belief. Even in the face of great fear or when her power is taken away from her, Lauren moves, continues to move forward toward action and it is through her actions that the Earthsea community is born. Friends, the fear of being right or wrong or your assumptions of someone else's power does not negate your call to action. There is no such thing as a perfect condition. Sometimes you will have to say yes to the thing that scares you. Sometimes you have to trust that the one who gave you the talent did so because they believe you have the tools to double it. You have to trust that your step towards action, as clumsy as it may be, is worth more than what you think it will cost you. I pray that this true faithfulness will lead you beyond your personal piety to touch lost, broken, afraid, and needy people. It will require you to look to God and to look to others and to dig deep within and to do something, even scary things, but to do much more than nothing. Servants, whether first or third, our call is the same. Faithfully participate in responding to God. Remember God's tender love and care for all and participate in making that reality our reality wherever we find ourselves, according to what we have been given, especially when it costs us. Will you pray with me? To the God who trusts us with little so that we may, be, we may learn to be faithful, we thank you. We admit that there are times when we are afraid of what is at stake in our being faithful. We admit that we often choose to do nothing and convince ourselves that the stakes are too high or that we are not good enough. God, we let go of our fear and our pride and instead take up your call to remain vigilant and faithful in the face of great evil. Show us that the reward for our faithfulness in loving our neighbor, regardless of what it costs, will be seen in abundance. Show us that this reward can be found 
in our neighbor and that together we can see the manifestation of a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Please join me in our closing prayer. First, <clears throat> first, hold your hands out with the palms up as if you are receiving a gift. Then listen to and pray along with these words in your heart. Lord God, you have crafted each of us with particular care, lovingly giving each one of us gifts and talents, treasure far beyond what our clay exterior would indicate. Now each of you hold your hands to your heart. Teach us to use them well in truth and in love, extending the same love and care to both ourselves and others. Now hold your hands high in surrender, so that when you return, we will return all we have been entrusted with to you. May it be a joyous meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Please receive these words of benediction from Scripture, and after hearing them, be free to greet one another as you make your way to your noontime meal. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, and you are sent.